Today, I'm going to explain why you are not falling through your chair right now, using one simple fact and one object. The fact is that all electrons are the same as each other, and the object is a structurally critical item of my clothing. There's a chance that this episode could get a little weird, and I mean quantum weird. By now, we've established that quantum spin is very weird. Now, we talked all about that recently, how electrons have spin but aren't really rotating, and about how you need to turn an electron around twice, 720 degrees, to get it back to its starting position. They are, we say, spin half, because one normal rotation only gets you halfway around. That particular weirdness is not just another cute case of quantum mechanics being a bit silly. The fact that some particles have this property is the entire reason that stuff in our universe has structure, and that matter doesn't immediately collapse. It's the source of the Pauli exclusion principle, and today I'm going to show you why this simple property makes it possible for us to have nice things in our universe. Particles with spin half, or more generally any half integer spin, 3 on 2, 5 on 2, etc., are called fermions, and include all of the particles that we think of as matter from electrons to quarks to the neutrinos. The other spin behavior is to have integer spin. Spin 1, for example, is the much more sensible case of a single 360 degree rotation getting you back to the starting point. Integer spin particles are bosons, and they are the force carrying particles like photons with spin 1, or the Higgs particle with spin 0. It's possible to stack as many bosons on top of each other as you like. For example, in a laser beam, there's no limit to the number of photons that you can add, all of them are in the same quantum state, but not fermions. No two fermions can share the same quantum state, which is why electrons can't occupy the same energy states in atoms. Without this, electrons in multi-electron atoms would all fall into the same lowest energy state. All atoms would be the minimum possible size, and there would be no such thing as chemistry, no nice things like solids or molecules. The non-overlappability of fermions is called the Pauli exclusion principle. I'm going to show you why this is inevitable behavior of groups of particles that have two properties. One, this weird rotational symmetry, and two, indistinguishability, which is just the fact that all electrons, for example, are exactly the same. There is no observable change when you swap two electrons. Combining spin behavior and indistinguishability gives us something called the spin statistics theorem, which sounds complicated, but I'm going to derive it with just some basic arithmetic and my belt. What do you think I was gonna say? Before we get to my belt, let me remind you about spinners. We talked about them in a recent episode, but for now, just know that it's just the type of wave function that fermions have, and that it has this property that it returns to its starting state with a 720 degree rotation, not 360. In that previous episode, we saw this amazing animation of an object rotating while being fixed by bands to its surrounding environment. Crazily, the bands disentangle every 720 degrees. So a spinner's rotational weirdness is not necessarily all that quantum, it's a natural function of how it's connected to the universe. So allow me to introduce you to the belt trick, first conceived by Paul Dirac himself. It goes like this. Hold the end of the belt in each hand so the belt is flat. Let's think of the belt buckle as a particle, say an electron. And the belt is its connection to whatever, the universe or maybe to another electron. Now, rotate the electron a full 720 degrees so you have a double twist. Now, I'm going to untwist it without rotating either end of the belt. Watch. Now, at this point, I'm letting go of the buckle but the important thing is that the orientation of the belt ends don't change with respect to each other. And there you go, the twists are gone. So the system under these sorts of rotations is a spinner because a 720 degree twist is topologically equivalent to no twist. Simple translation of the ends transforms between the states. On the other hand, if we rotate one end 360 degrees, we can't untangle the belt if we keep the ends fixed. We can think of both ends of the belt as spinner particles, like electrons. And in that case, we can do another experiment. What happens if the ends exchange positions? If we're careful not to rotate either end with respect to each other, then the belt ends up with a single twist in it, 
equivalent to a 360 degree rotation of one end. So it seems that for spinners, a 360 degree rotation is equivalent to the particles switching places. This is slightly worrying. If we're using our hands as analogies for electrons, then we just demonstrated that it makes a difference if we switch their locations. And that's a problem if electrons are supposed to be indistinguishable, which is one of the critical ingredients of the spin statistics theorem. We'll come back to how electrons can have this property and yet still be indistinguishable. Okay, let's summarize what we've learned. There are objects that require a 720 degree rotation to return to their original configuration in terms of their relationship to other objects. We call these things spinners. For these same objects, spinners, a 360 degree rotation is the same thing as swapping places with a second spinner, at least in terms of the relationship between those spinners. Okay, how do we connect all of this to actual electrons? Well, electrons don't really rotate in the classical sense. They're quantum objects described by a quantum wave function. A wave function is this thing that holds the information about the probability of a given property being observed. For example, the wave function representing the position of a particle can look like a sine wave moving through space. If you have two such wave functions overlapping, like two photons in a laser beam, a shift in one of them by half a wave cycle puts the two out of phase with each other. In that case, they actually cancel each other out and you effectively have no photons. Mathematically, a half cycle phase shift corresponds to putting a negative sign in front of the wave function. And that makes sense because adding the two wave functions causes them then to sum to zero. A spinner wave function of the electron can wave through space but it also includes another wavy part. It has a rotational degree of freedom in which a full wave cycle is a 720 degree rotation. In that case, a 360 degree rotation puts a spinner perfectly out of phase compared to its starting point. So a 360 degree rotation introduces a negative sign to the spinner wave function. And that little negative sign is ultimately what drives the difference between fermions and bosons. Okay, so summarizing again, electrons are spinners and so require a 720 degree rotation to be returned to their initial state, but a 360 degree rotation shifts their phase by a half cycle and adds a minus one to the wave function. But we also know from the belt trick analogy that swapping two spinners is the same as doing a 360 degree rotation, so that should put a negative sign in front of the combined wave function. And that's the last piece of the puzzle we need to get to the spin statistics theorem and the Pauli exclusion principle. Now all we need to do is the math, which you should relax about because we're literally just doing addition and subtraction here. Let's think about the quantum state of an electron. We'll call it psi. Psi gives the distribution of probabilities of some observable. For example, the location of the electron around the atom. Psi is really the so-called probability amplitude. The actual probability distribution is the square of that. We can never ever observe psi. All we can do is map psi squared by making multiple measurements. The unobservability of psi is critical to this whole explanation, so remember that. Now let's put our electron in an atom, in the ground state, and add a second electron to the first excited state. We can think of these two electrons as having a shared wave function, a two particle wave function we'll call psi a, B, which has two electrons, A and B, in which one occupies the ground state and one occupies the first excited state. And we'll see what actually goes into this wave function shortly. But first, let's see how this thing should behave based on the stuff we figured out earlier. Electrons are fermions, which means that if we swap their location, the wave function gets multiplied by minus one. Electron A goes into the first excited state and B goes into the ground state. So we now have psi b a, and we know that psi a b equals minus psi b a. Wave functions that change sign like this when its particle labels are swapped are called antisymmetric under particle interchange. And those that don't change sign are unsurprisingly called symmetric. Fermions have antisymmetric wave functions, bosons symmetric. Remember that we wanted fermions to be indistinguishable from each other. But it seems like the two particle wave function actually changes if we swap the particles. So doesn't that give us a way to distinguish the swap? 
Well, actually, no. No observable property is changed by this swap. Remember that we only observe the square of the wave function. And in that square, the minus sign goes away. The square of psi AB is equal to the square of psi BA. But although we can't distinguish electron A from electron B through observation of these particles, it turns out that this subtle, unobservable property has a powerful manifestation in the behavior of groups of fermions. To see that, we need to see what this two-particle wave function looks like in terms of the individual wave functions of our two electrons. We'll call the individual electron wave functions G and F, if you like, for the ground and the first excited state of the atom. But this works really for any two possible wave functions, two possible quantum states that our electrons could have. If electron A is in the ground state, then its wave function is G A. If it's in the first excited state, it's F A and the same for electron B. Now, let's say we don't know which of A or B are in the ground or the excited states. The two particle wave function needs to be a combination of F and G covering all of the possibilities. In fact, all possible combinations are summed together in what we call a superposition. There is one way to do this that captures the anti-symmetric nature of what we're looking for. And it looks like this, which we can think of as the sum of A being in the ground state, B in the excited, then B in the ground and A in the excited. Each term in a superposition has a coefficient out front, and in this case the coefficient for the second term is minus one. We're choosing it because it works. To prove it, let's switch the particles, and the wave function sign should flip. We want psi AB to become psi BA and psi BA is just the thing we saw with all the A's and the B's switched. And that is just the negative of the original. So psi BA actually equals negative psi AB. Swapping the electrons flips the sign. So we've successfully discovered the wave function for a pair of fermions. Bear with me, we're getting very close to our proof now. I'm gonna show you that we can't shove both electrons into the same state. Let's say we want both electrons to be in the ground state. The two particle wave function would then look like this. The F's become G's. Now, both components of the superposition are the same, with the exception that the second component has the minus sign, which causes those two components to cancel out. Essentially, two electrons shoved into the same state end up perfectly out of phase and so destructively interfere. But you can't just vanish electrons so the transition of an electron into an occupied quantum state is impossible. This statement, together with what we saw from the belt trick previously about spinners having anti-symmetric wave functions, is the Pauli exclusion principle. That is, particles with half integer spin have anti-symmetric wave functions, the belt trick relation, and particles with anti-symmetric wave functions cannot have multiple particles in the same quantum state. The full spin statistics theorem has a lot more to it. One part of it is a rather more rigorous explanation of why spinners must have anti-symmetric wave functions that doesn't involve any pad retention technology. It boils down to the fact that you need to use spinners in the Dirac equation, which is the quantum equation of motion for electrons and other spin half particles. That equation by itself doesn't force you to use symmetric or anti-symmetric wave functions, but if you try to use the symmetric wave functions of the boson, then you get bad wrong results. Specifically, the energy level spectrum becomes unbounded from below, meaning you can continually move energy from the system by lowering the state of the particle forever. But if you use the correct anti-symmetric wave function, then everything just works out great. So it's a proof by contradiction. Particles described by spinners have to have anti-symmetric wave functions and so must obey the Pauli exclusion principle or you get nonsense. So there you have it. Matter has structure and you don't fall through your chair because electrons are indistinguishable and they obey a simple, if odd, rotational symmetry. Ironically, to prove the structural integrity of matter, I had to compromise the structural integrity of my pan situation. Revealing the mysteries of the universe sometimes comes with the risk of revealing mysteries. But that is a risk we'll always take for you here on Spacetime.
Hey everyone, thank you for clicking, watching, and hopefully liking and subscribing. It's really, really helpful for you to do all that stuff. And for those of you who go even further and support us on Patreon, well, words can't convey our gratitude, but let me try anyway. Today, I want to give a special thank you to Ethan Cohen, who's supporting us at the Quasar level. Ethan, you're about as far as I can imagine from being indistinguishable or degenerate. That makes you some exotic form of matter, presumably unbound by the laws of known physics. So thank you for interacting with us lowly fermionic life forms. Our heads are spinning in gratitude for your support. Today, we're doing comment responses from the last two episodes. The one about reverberation mapping, where we map the stuff around black holes by watching how light bounces around. And the episode where we took a journey into the weird pasta-filled core of a neutron star. Greg Gorman says that he imagined that black holes would look more like dim stars rather than, well, black holes because they slingshot light from behind them. So it's true that black holes do this, but if you have good enough resolution, you'll always be able to see the dark disk in the middle. That's because the light rays will travel in a straight line after the slingshot, so at most they can appear to be coming from the edge of the event horizon. And that's exactly why the event horizon telescope image looks like it does. Although in that case, the dark area is a little larger because most of the light gets slingshotted from a bit further out, the photosphere, where light can actually orbit the black hole. Greta and Sixfly says that when they were in school, quasars were just discovered, and there was speculation that they might be white holes. So I came along only a little after. I imagine those were giddy, exciting times. There was speculation that quasars could be swarms of neutron stars or supernova cascades or even bizarre objects flying at crazy speeds out of the Milky Way. Happily, the winning hypothesis of enormous black holes was as awesome as all of the others. Dave Lawrence rightly calls me out for saying that reverberation mapping can be done with an ordinary scope. So I don't mean your typical Toys R Us, my first telescope. But even a high-end amateur telescope with an admittedly ridiculously expensive digital detector and spectrograph could take a spectrum of a bright quasar and see the different components of that light vary in different ways over months or years. Not advisable for a school science project, but it's still really cool that this is doable at all. Mehul Mishra asks what would happen if you plucked one neutron out of the weird gridlocked plasma crystal lattice of the crust of a neutron star. And then, my favourite thing happened, someone who knows more than me answered that question. Proteus tells us that that hole can only be filled by an adjacent particle, which then just shifts the location of the hole. In this way, the hole sort of acts like its own particle moving around the lattice. But this pseudo-particle is less dense than its surroundings, so it eventually rises to the surface and so gets eliminated from the lattice. And I'm very happy that we sorted this one out. Stephen Spackman also rightly calls me out for using an expression up to 10% or more of the speed of light regarding how fast gas can be blasted away from a quasar. I agree that up to 10% or more can be literally any number whatsoever, which means I'm not wrong, but also not useful. The broad emission lines of quasars show that the gas is typically moving away from the black hole anywhere from a few percent to 10% of the speed of light, and in rare cases, even faster. I will try to speak with better error bars in the future. And finally, Steve Boguki tells us that space-time made him realize that he's more interested in quantum physics than astrophysics. Hey, at least you didn't devote decades of your professional life to astrophysics before having that revelation. No, I'm totally kidding. I love astrophysics like my awe-inspiring firstborn child. But quantum mechanics is my weird and brilliant and deeply compelling secondborn, and I love you all the same, I swear.